Do we have any fizzy yellow beer drinkers here tonight? They will have the bravery to identify themselves. See, that's typical of fizzy yellow beer drinkers. They don't really speak up. On tap, Stone Brewing Company. Did you think we were idiots? Hi. I'm James Knott, and this is the Better Beer Authority. Today, we have a special guest, Greg Cook, the CEO and co-founder of Stone Brewing Company in Escondido, California. It is the 14th largest craft brewery in the U.S., but many beer enthusiasts would argue that their influence on the craft beer scene is much larger than that. Greg has a new book called The Craft of Stone Brewing Company, Liquid Lore, Epic Recipes, and Unabashed Arrogance. It features the history of stone brewing, stories about their beers, recipes from the Stone World Bistro, and home brewing recipes of some of their famous beers. Greg, who is this book aimed at, and why does a brewery need a book? This book um, was is help us celebrate the 15th anniversary of Stone, and it helps tell the Stone story, why we have been so, so successful over so many years how we've been the fastest growing brewery in the entire country over the last 15 years on a year-over-year -year annual percentage growth basis. And uh, this story is a bit of an entrepreneurial story. It's a beer geek story. It's a, um, you know, boy falls in love with beer, boy, uh, you know, has a new career kind of a story. Yeah. And, and so uh, the third of the book is the Stone Brewing Company story. Our thoughts, our philosophies, why we did things the way that we did them, what we were thinking at the time, where we hope to go someday is in this book. And then a third of it is uh, recipes um, from the Stone Brewing World Bistro and Gardens. And the other third is uh, history on all of the beers that we've ever produced with the largest collection of homebrew recipes that we've ever assembled in one place. 18 homebrew recipes for our stone beers. Now, with the homebrewing recipes, are you worried about like you're giving away your secrets? <laughs> yeah, unquestionably, actually, it did feel like you know opening the kimono. Uh, it feels like you're burying yourself in, in an uncomfortable way in yeah. some ways. And but we decided, um, you know, the recipes uh, for our beers are just part of who we are. And there's a lot more of who we are that is uh, philosophy-based, if you will, yeah. and sharing-based. And we love this craft beer world. We're beer geeks. And we like doing things that we think are cool. And frankly, when you look at it, what's cooler? To share a bunch of recipes or to not share a bunch of recipes? Yeah. Because I noticed, the sharing was cooler. I noticed the recipe for Arrogant Bastard wasn't in there. Yeah, uh, well. <laughs> an error of omission. Well, I have to admit, an error of intentional om omission. So, <laughs> from the very beginning, we've simply never shared any information. I think that a lot of people out there in, in the blogosphere and in the home brewing uh, worlds have some pretty good ideas. Uh, but I've, you know, I've always been the neither, neither confirm nor deny. Uh, just to, you know, do your best. If you got an arrogant bastard ale recipe, brew it up, side by side it. You think you're close? Let me know. Uh, <laughs> I've tasted some mighty good clone recipes, but yeah. none that have tasted like Arrogant Bastard Ale. You feel like you could always tell the difference? Oh, easily, yeah. So, but mighty good recipes all the same. So uh, I think as a home brewer, part of the time you want to nail something if you're going for a particular goal, but part of the time, hey, just nail a really amazingly tasty beer. That works pretty well. Yeah. Arrogant Bastard in the book seemed like it was kind of a turning point for Stone. Is that true? It definitely helped us get some attention at a time when, frankly, we needed it. We were struggling with critical mass. We were struggling with uh, critical acceptance. Uh, not so much critical acceptance, actually, of, of you know, public acceptance in our world of San Diego. This is back in 96, 97. Uh, people weren't thinking craft beer. People weren't embracing it. Uh, the, the first bubble had burst in 96. Magically, the year we opened, great timing. You might want to follow me into the stock market someday. That would probably work out well for you, too. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, it was, uh, I, I, don't, I don't want to get into, you know, stories about how uh, when I started, you know, we had to walk uphill both ways in the snow, barefoot, you know, it was harder then. Yeah. You kids have it so easy today. <laughs> um, but uh, well, it time, was a very different time. It was a revolutionary beer at the time, right? I mean, there was nothing out there like it, really. There was, was nothing there? out there like it, but it was also a time 
when craft beers were getting, uh, you know, weren't getting ex consumer acceptance. Uh, people weren't interested. People weren't blogging about it, doing video blogs about it. Mm -hmm. They weren't tweeting about it or Facebooking about it. Of course, those didn't exist. Uh, but they weren't even social media, you know, Beer Advocate and Rape Beer didn't come uh, until a, a few years later. Beer Advocate started around the same time we did, but it didn't become what we know of it today until a few years later. And uh, so w there wasn't much way for beer enthusiasts, for us to, to communicate with each other. You've made more progress from your a slightly rocky start a uh, year and a half ago. <laughs> well, I was going to bring that up, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd throw it out there. Um, but you've been able to make more progress with your personal beer curve than I was able to make in three, four years of intensive research and travel and discovery when I started in 1987 learning about good beer. Just because learning about it, finding it, Going right. to it was so much more difficult today. You kids have it easy today. You better appreciate what you've got <laughs> and finish your vegetables. Well, that's uh, my next question was, you know, we, we obviously, our first interaction was we came out the review of Arrogant Bastard. It wasn't favorable at all. It got posted on beeradvocate.com on their forum and all the beer nerds went crazy and just beat us up left and right. <laughs> and if anything came out of it, it was that Stone looked really good because everyone was there defending Stone. I do feel cheated. It's 18 bucks a six pack. For Christ's sake, I could buy a case of beer that we all drink on a normal basis, all right? So, uh... Would that be the uh, fizzy yellow beer? Yeah, that's it. This is not a better beer. Definitely not a better beer. I'm ranking this a four because, James, I don't think I'd ever buy this again. It's subpar to me. Well, I, I think you took it really well, by the way, because I remember posting something. I think I tried to be a little bit polite, but I sometimes can fail at that. <laughs> <laughs> how, how was my response to you? It was, it was I think, fine. I think we deserved I gave you a lot of what a we little, A little bit of a what for. <laughs> uh, I probably said something I don't remember. Did I say something like, welcome to better beer? Clearly you're new here. Yeah, go back and drink your fizzy yellow beer. <laughs> no, I don't say that because I don't no, want that to I wouldn't wish that on anybody. <laughs> now, did you think we were idiots? Uh, I would say newbies is the word I would choose. Newbies. Uh, there was one guy on your panel that did uh, maybe intentionally come off as an idiot. Maybe he was trying too hard to be. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't want to make that judgment. But uh, I was, you know, getting at that, you know, now not just because you've told me that you like Stone, which is terrific, but just knowing uh, where you've gone with your blog and, and your your self-discovery or you know, your discovery of, uh, of craft beer. This is a cool world to be in, isn't it? It's a yeah. cool world no, to it's, just go down that rabbit hole. It's a lot of fun. I can tell you on day one when we started the show that 95% uh, of the beer I was drinking was of one of the major brands. <laughs> But you know now it's the kind now what of, percentage? Now I would say you know probably less than five percent. Less it's than definitely, five. It's definitely you know yeah. I go to some tailgates. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I do go to some tailgates. I either pre-verify that they've got good beer there, or I'm bringing it my damn self. Yeah, uh, you know every once in a while somebody will uh, make a comment that uh, they think it's uh, a snobbery if you um, make sure that you've got something of mm -hmm. decent quality that you want when you go to something like a tailgate or something and. Uh, I like it. You know, if, if, uh, if, you know, really adhering to that life's too short to drink bad beer um, philosophy or of the philosophy that I like, which is I love sharing what we do, what other great craft breweries do with people that maybe aren't so familiar. If you want to call that snobbery, more power to you. <laughs> so I've been doing a little bit of research this week, and the one that I had the first time that I really enjoyed was the Sublimely Self-Righteous Ale. I mean, that one really surprised me. It's a black IPA, and but right now it's definitely my favorite black IPA. I would recommend it to anyone. Yeah, I'm stoked that you like that. We first came out with it uh, for the Stone 11th Anniversary Ale. We liked it so much it did uh, return as a permanent addition to our lineup as the Stone Sublimely Self-Righteous Ale. Uh, it just got mentioned in Draft Beer's Top 25 Beers for 2011, which was a nice nod, and uh, ah, I love that beer. It's pretty tasty. I think you can hear it in my voice. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, mm, yeah. So getting back to the Arrogant Bastard, like not just from us in that particular case, but is it hard to take criticism? I mean, you're, 
in the trenches doing it. And it's got to be like, hey, if you're so great, why don't you go out and brew it yourself? It's so hard to take criticism. Well, or do you a tune criticism, it out? Uh, I do my best to tune it out uh, because it serves no purpose. It doesn't serve you. And I actually <laughs> talk about that in this book, in the introduction. Um, do you mind? Maybe I'll actually, I'll quote myself. I'll, I'll, tell, <laughs> I'll share these, you know, what I think is the, uh, um, <clears throat> it may take me half a second to find it here. Well, it, it's available on Amazon.com and maybe other places. <laughs> yeah, it is. We'll put a link in the comments section. Okay. So uh, basically I say, um, if you do something that you're quite good at and you're doing it your way, then it's simply up to me as a potential customer to decide for myself if I like what you do or not. If I do, then I've just discovered that someone, that finally someone is doing whatever it is that you do in a way that I like it, in a way I can appreciate it. But if I don't like what you do, I'm free to move on. And so what I actually advocate to people who are doing things that they believe in, like you and your show, if you get critiques, listen to all the ones that are working to uh, support you in your, vis your vision. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, uh, hey, the audio was a little poor on you know, my computer, it would help if you did this. And that supports you in your vision because they'd like to hear you better. Right. But if they say, you're an idiot and you just don't, your taste sucks and blah, 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 blah. You don't have any ketchup at the brewery. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, then that doesn't support your vision. That doesn't help you. I say, ignore it. Mm -hmm. um, I believe in the philosophy of, of ignore everybody. Ignore everybody except those for whom they are supporting you in your vision. Because it, it detracts from, from really creativity. Yeah, it's a good point. In the book, you refer to yourself as loud, outspoken, uptight, tense, driven, and also that maybe you've been a rather large asshole. Has that ever been? Did, did I do that all in one place, or did you collect that from different I pages? I collect different kind of words. <laughs> Those are from different spots. But, <laughs> but has that ever backfired on you? Oh, constantly. Everything that we've ever done has backfired on us in some ways. But that's the ignore everybody thing. We Look, if I believe in my beers, and I do, then I've got to be able to with, either withstand the criticism or, like I say, completely ignore it because it doesn't help me do what we do better. If we believe in what we're doing is doing, you know, doing our very best and we're doing anything of any quality or character. So... Um, Backfire in a way that uh, truly hurts us? Uh, no, only if we give credence to the, you know, the detractors. Mm -hmm. So Stone Distributing distributes other craft beers. You pour other craft beers at the bistro. Is, isn't that just promoting the competition? No, it's promoting our compatriots. I believe that the world of craft beer is better with great craft beer. So, what that means is, or I'll put it another way, the more people are exposed to great craft beer, the more people will accept, appreciate, learn about great craft beer. Um, if it was only Stone and we were doing this solo, uh, you know, I think the world wouldn't be as much fun. I really love celebrating this world with other quality brewers. Mm -hmm. uh, and I love celebrating what they do. So we actively help to uh, promote other brands. We have a distribution company in, in Southern California and we have about 32 amazing craft brands that we represent. We get them out to the markets, we get them out to the pubs and the restaurants throughout Southern California. And as you mentioned at our restaurant, we have more guest beers on tap than we do of our own. And uh, we have a 130 bottle list, uh, usually maybe four of them are stone and the rest are guest beers, but no commodity beers. Only especially great quality craft beers that we would stand behind to our guests at our restaurant. And uh, yeah, I think of, you know, we're, we're compatriots fighting on the front, the common front for the right for great beer in this country. Stone has a, a reputation as being very aggressive with the hops. Is it, is it hard to stick out now that so many people are putting so many hops in their beer? I mean, I tasted the full lineup and only maybe two, three of them are not like aggressively hoppy. I can find one in the Stone Smoke Porter. Stone, I suppose the Stone, Stone Smoke Pale Porter Ale. Stone Pale Ale. At the time that we released this, this was our very first beer in 1996. Um, 
this was considered very hoppy for the time. Yeah. And it was, uh, people's reactions generally were, wow, this is so bitter. <laughs> and of course, you and I, we think of this today, and we're Stone Pale, oh no, this is very nicely balanced. Right. Um, so uh, there's no question that we've been a part of moving the needle. Uh, Stone Ruination IPA, uh, do you have it here? Oh, I do, it of course. Yeah. <laughs> I like that answer. So the Stone Ruination IPA, this was the world's first full-time brewed and bottled double IPA on the planet. The first one. June of 2002 when we released this, there were no other brewers making a double IPA full-time that I'm aware of. Correct me if you think that I'm wrong, that I'm missing something, because I'd like to have the record set straight. Um, and we had been brewing uh, ev uh, elevated uh, versions of Stone IPA for our anniversary uh, beers, uh, the Stone Second Anniversary IPA through the Stone Fifth Anniversary IPA, which were increasingly more and more hoppy and higher in alcohol, and this was then our homage to that series, if you will. Um, so we've helped to set uh, set the benchmark. Well, you know, set the tone. I get accused of saying high and mighty things about ourselves <laughs> all the time. So. So, you know, don't stop now. <laughs> well, you know, look, but I, I really look. I think we're great. Do I think we're the end all, be all? No, I never did. Yeah. I think that's impossible in the world of brewing. And and if if we try, we would fall short. I think all we need to do is just focus on what we do and try and do an amazing job at what we do. But also embrace all the wonderful stuff everybody else does. We have been inspired by others, and we have inspired others. Yeah. Speaking of inspiration, Anchor Steam seems like it was kind of a pivotal beer for several members at Stone. Well, because Anchor was around for so long and it was solo in the beer business for so long that, um, you know, as, as a the first epiphany, it was for some periods of time, the only one out there. Now, when I first discovered it in 1987, which I consider to be kind of late in the game, Mm -hmm. uh, it, you know, there were some other craft beers around, but Anchor was the first one I discovered. And uh, I, had a, I had two reactions. One was, wow, I, I had no idea beer could taste like this. This is amazing. And the other half of the reaction was, I was pissed off. I was pissed off because I realized that my previous beer drinking years had been stolen from me by the lies, the lies that the man was telling me. <laughs> the lies that the man told me about that that stuff was beer, that fizzy yellow stuff, <laughs> that ain't beer. Well, speaking of the man. The man. Your, your brewmaster came fr from the man, from Anheuser-Busch. No, he did not come from the man, he came through the man. Through the man. I was just wondering, you know, this. <laughs> The book paints a pretty rosy picture, but did you ever have second thoughts about hiring him because uh, of that? So, Mitch Steele, uh, he started off his brewing career at a small brewery in, in Northern California. Uh, then he worked, went and worked at a winery for a number of years. And uh, then for a period of time, he was working for Anheuser Bush. And uh, eventually, as I like to say, we, we, we rescued him. <laughs> or, or we brought him back home uh, to our side. Uh, and I was concerned initially. I, I knew a little bit of Mitch's reputation, um, and I met him, and I, I like the guy, and everybody that knows Mitch loves Mitch, because he's so willing to share information. He's so passionate. And I actually gave uh, a talk to the National Homebrewers Convention in Florida, right around the same time that we were taking a look at Mitch. And a bunch of his homebrewing partners uh, from New Hampshire, they were down for the conference, and I got a chance to talk to him in just the way that they talked about Mitch. This guy, he's a passion, he homebrewed with him every weekend. I can tell you, it's less common uh, for professional brewers to homebrew. It yeah. really is. They, they're brewing, they're brewing all day, every day. You know, that kind of thing. You don't tend to homebrew. But Mitch was homebrewing so often with these guys. And they tell me, oh yeah, we made this with him and he's this and you know, and this and he always shares this and he brought this. And, and I could tell, I could tell what Mitch was all about because mm -hmm. that showed through. And uh, boy, uh, was I right with my assessment on that. I yeah. mean, you know, I was right in understanding who Mitch was because Mitch has been great at Stone. Um, we love him, we respect him, and he is, I, I, you point me to a more passionate uh, brewer, I think that could be difficult. 
as passionate, yeah, there's a lot of really amazing passionate people out there. More, whew, that would be tough. Yeah. Uh, Stone promotes environmental initiatives. It's, uh, I noticed on the website and in the book, you might have a couple of references or whatever. Is making beer, is it hard for it to, to keep it environmentally sound or anything like that? I mean, because you have the transportation of the beer, you have the use of the water and all that stuff. What's Stone's approach to that? It's tough to do almost anything in this world environmentally sound. Yeah. Um, you can change this to, you know, uh, an incandescent light bulb or a, or a fluorescent light bulb, but better, more efficient light bulb, but you won't get the right kind of color, right? Mm -hmm. So you're making a decision. I, I trust as soon as the show's over, you're going to turn back on the fluorescence, right? I don't know. You know so, but that's just a small example that everything is choices in our world. And what we do is try and make the very best choices and really stretch ourselves. And we're willing to stretch ourselves financially as well as, frankly, pain in the ass factor because it's important to us. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we have um, photovoltaics on our uh, roof of our building that uh, supplies about 30, 35% of the electricity we need. We have a local organic farm that we actually revived. It failed last year. We revived it this past March and it's providing veggies. Uh, for our restaurant, which I think organics uh, are very important. Um, we're definitely on that wagon. Um, and we try to just steward everything as best we can. We have one of the best ratios of water use in the industry, in the brewing industry. Uh, we clean up all of our own uh, brewery effluent. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, there's a host of things. I mean, I drive a Volt, but you know, uh, but whatever. It's, it's, you know, you just, all I say to people is, you don't actually have to do huge things. Just do small things. Do small things often, as, as often as you can. Yeah. Go to that, you know, if you, if, you, if you buy something in a plastic bottle, keep that plastic bottle with you until you personally steward it to the recycling bin, rather than, well, all there is is a regular trash can, so I'll just throw it away. You know, try and just focus on small things. Hey, try not to buy the plastic bottle in the first place if you can do without it. Have a reusable water jug that you carry with you and refill for free. You gotta do small things like that. That's all I advocate. And as a company, I think it's our responsibility to try and do bigger things as best we can. And that's how we approach it. Okay, Greg, it was awesome having you come. It's a pleasure. Really, really appreciated it. Greg Cook, CEO and co-founder of Stone Brewing Company. His book, um, The Craft of Stone Brewing Company, Liquid Lore, Epic Recipes, and Unabashed Arrogance is for sale on the internet. I'll put a link in the comments section below. Thanks for watching. I'm James Knott, and this is your Better Beer Authority. Better Beer Authority. Better Beer Authority.